this morning and uh, what I know is going to be extremely informative uh, presentations from our uh, keynote speaker, Dean Delavalle, followed by three panelists who uh, are going to uh, make brief remarks following Dean, and then we'll have a Q&A session. I'm Guy Caruso with the Energy and National Security Program here at uh, CSIS, and uh, really pleased to have you all here. You may have noticed a bit more security than normal because we're having uh, some more events later today with the, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Johnson, Jay Johnson will be here, and then following that, the Secretary General of the uh, People's Republic of Vietnam will be here. So it's an exciting day here, We're getting, and, uh, and this is part of our uh, U.S.-Australia speaker series. So we have a, a fair amount of orientation toward Asia uh, today. And uh, that's sort of CSIS's version of the pivot toward Asia, you know. So, uh, and we're uh, we're very pleased to uh, have Dean Delavalle as uh, our lead-off speaker from BHP Billiton, uh, based in Australia, one of the largest resource asset-owning companies in the world. Uh, have strong investments in all regions, and including North America, uh, is particularly coal, iron ore, copper, petroleum, oil and gas, and, and other uh, minerals as well, such as uranium and uh, I think potash. So it's a, it's a truly enormously uh, resource-rich company. And as you can imagine, being based in Australia has a very strong uh, market presence in in Asia, particularly China and India. And uh, I'm sure Dean will uh, will touch on uh, those markets as well because he has had enormously rich experience with 38 years uh, with BHP in all aspects of the business and recently was named its chief commercial officer. So the strategy that BHP uh, follows is very much uh, one of the things that Dean is very deeply uh, experienced in, and he'll talk about that today. So we're really pleased that Dean and his colleagues at BHP could uh, be here for this uh, part of our U.S. Australian speaker series. And then we've got three very good commenters from uh, different perspectives. Uh, we're going to have Catherine Spector will follow Dean uh, with brief comments from her perspective as a, a chief commodity strategist for CIBC, a Canadian uh, financial institution. Uh, Catherine's based in New York, but uh, CIBC is, uh, is based in Canada. Following Catherine will be uh, Alan Townsend, who's a uh, senior energy specialist at the World Bank and also looks uh, very closely at uh, emerging economies and, and, and their energy. And then our own uh, Scott Miller, who is the Shoal Chair for International Business here at CSIS and has rich and long experience in the commodities, uh, consumer commodity uh, business while he was at Procter & Gamble. So we really have a, a great lineup, and I'm not going to take any more time because uh, Dean's time is limited, and we want to hear from him, the panelists, and then we'll uh, have uh, uh, hopefully plenty of time for, uh, for your questions. Dean, we really appreciate your coming and, and uh, sharing some of your insights because I think we're going to see a very different perspective from, from BHP, and that's uh, why we're so excited to have Dean and, uh, and, uh, and our fellow panelists here to talk about that today.
Thanks very much, Guy, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you today in your great nation's uh, capital. It's a, I think it's my second visit here, and I have to say it uh, never, never ceases to impress me. So BHP Builton, like many other organisations around the world, we, we seek to understand what the ramifications of changes on the way are. And the questions we ask ourselves are, what does a new normal in China mean? What is the reform agenda in India going to revolve into? And what's going to happen in Paris this year? When we look at these, we actually bring a probably a slightly different uh, and unique aspect to how we look at them in the fact that uh, we do bottom-up bills, we understand what their customers' needs are, and we take a very commodity-based view to start with, but obviously with an overlay of economics on top. So hopefully it's a little bit different to what you would see from just a, a straight top-down view. But before I, I talk about our view, um, I would like to talk about our company a little bit, and I know Guy's given a, a very a good uh, rendition of it, but the fact I was in, I was in uh, at an event yesterday and I was introduced as the, the Chief Commercial Officer for maybe the largest company in the world you've never heard of, so I think I wouldn't mind just uh, making sure you've heard of it before I leave today. I'd feel I was completely remiss if I left Washington and you had not heard of it. So BHP Billiton, as Guy said, we've actually been around for 130 years uh, this year. Uh, we've been supplying commodities to the world throughout that period. Um, we are headquartered in Australia and uh, we continue to evolve. It was only this year in June that we actually demerged 10% of our company to focus back onto four very large core pillars. So, and they are coal, which is based in Australia, iron ore, but also based in Australia, but with operations in uh, South America. We have our copper business, which is based in Santiago and Chile. And of course, our petroleum business based here in the US in Houston. And, all, and we have another option in potash, which uh, I almost have accountability for, but uh, that's something for the future. But uh, we operate in about eight countries. The other unique thing about our organisation is that uh, we have a central marketing team. They are based in Singapore, Asian focused and looking. Um, the fact that 65% uh, of our customers are in Asia and they have sub branches in Shanghai, in Tokyo, and New Delhi. So with that focus, it was certainly in our customer interface, we feel that uh, we are as close as we possibly can be to, to our customers and to the knowledge we need to make the right decisions about our business and to understand what's going on. We operate high quality, large assets, that's our strategy, to stay upstream. And, and we are quite unique in that we offer, we offer commodities for steel making, we offer commodities for the energy market and quite unique in that, in that we offer coal, oil, gas and uranium, so we offer the full suite. And obviously we have our potash business, as I said, which is something for the future that uh, possibly as diets change and commodity requirements move on. So it is, a, it is quite a, a portfolio spread and we think this gives us resilience by the size and quality of our assets, where we're based and the markets uh, we're in, it's a, it makes our, our company quite resilient. So we talk about economic development. And resources and energy are crucial at all stages of economic development. And there is a recurring theme here. First, you have the urbanisation phase. As developing economies evolve, in investment-led growth in, in infrastructure drives an increase in steel demand. And again, we have the commodities to actually supply that. Then you generally move to an industrialisation phase. So as, as economies mature and move into manufacturing-led growth, demand for electricity and copper increases. And then thirdly, we have the consumer-led growth. Citizens enjoy the benefit of the first two phases, their wealth increases, and consumption-led growth further increases demand for energy resources and agriculture as people's diets change and shift towards higher protein. The US economy here is a great example of that development cycle, which started at the time of the Industrial Revolution, very well documented and is used as a benchmark in all other economies. So we talk about commodity demand in Asia and specifically here. So what we've seen in Asia over the last 15 years is extraordinary. It's the greatest industrialization event the world has ever seen. China and East Asia experienced the largest migration in human history with 200 million people moving into urban areas in the decade to 2010. 
While regional planners face the challenge of accommodating these new urban residents, the existing and typically wealthier urban population seeks better quality housing and modern amenities typically associated with a high quality of life. As China works to rebalance its economy from investment towards consumption, demand for growth commodities has slowed to a more normal and sustainable, to a sustainable level compared to the frenetic pace we saw earlier, which drove a lot of supply into the market. And while the pace of economic growth has slowed, the incremental contribution is now from a much larger base. In the last seven years, China's economy has doubled to become the second largest economy in the world. And its growth is still pegged to outpace the OECD. China remains a significant contributor to world's total growth and its demand for energy and commodities continues to be within our expected range. And no doubt we'll see some volatility and some bumps and lumps in the way, but it certainly continues on the road that you'd expect. So we just talk about energy. Global energy demand is projected to grow by 25% by 2030. So that's according to the, the statistics of the International Energy Agency. While developed countries continue to improve energy efficiency, energy demand in emerging economies is increasing significantly with electricity generation and transport leading the way. Asia is expected to account for 60% of the global energy demand growth. China and India alone will make up more than half of that total. By 2030, 1.7 billion people are expected to have access to electricity for the first time, significantly improving their living standards, as we all know. Energy for industrial use in manufacturing will also grow to meet rising demand for consumables. With increasing incomes, people in developing countries will have a higher standard of living and seek basic comforts, and they'll want the things that you and I and everyone else in this room wants on a daily basis. If we look at India, Less than 10% of households currently have air conditioning, and yet by 2030, we project that could be 40%, a significant increase. And if you just take that as a ratio of how you'd actually ratio other commodities and other amenities, you get the feel for the pace and the growth what's going to happen. As more and more households in developing countries buy cars, the need for transportation fuel will increase. China's demand for automobiles could grow to be close to 300 vehicles for every 1,000 people by 2030. Still well below what you see here in the United States of around 700 per 1,000 people. So it's a lot more vehicles in China, it's gonna be a lot more steel, a lot more copper, and certainly more fuel to drive in whichever type of fuel they use. And if you can actually take that and correlate that, and actually the corollary of that is then you have to house these vehicles, which really means you have bigger buildings with bigger basements, bigger garage, more steel. So it all tends to build on each other. Income growth in developing countries will see a change in diet towards more protein-rich foods, fruits and vegetables, driving an increase in global crop demand. In the face of limited land and water resources, greater crop yields will be required from a combination of improved farming practices and more fertilizers such as potash. So how are we gonna do this within the environmental, foot, environmental footprint we know we need to contain ourselves to. The volume of resources to support population economic growth will put pressure on the environment. Developed countries will have to reduce their environmental impact, while developing countries will need to sustain development with, without significantly increasing their environmental impact. National efforts to reduce emissions can come under great, will come under great scrutiny as a focus shifts in December for the next UN Climate Summit in Paris. At BHP Builton, we have accepted the science of climate change, the work of the IPCC for over two decades. Complementary policy measures are needed to improve energy efficiency, drive low cost reductions in emissions, support the development of low emission technology to build resilience to the impacts of climate change and to address sustainable development. We are taking action to reduce our own emissions and work with others to support effective policy development. 
We are also exploring opportunities to invest in low emission technologies like carbon capture and storage. Every nation will choose its own energy mix, which balances affordability and security of supply to fulfill their demand while reducing emissions. Fossil fuels for energy use in the developing world will remain the dominant source as their affordability and scale of existing infrastructure make them hard to replace. In 2030, 50% of the newly installed electricity in capacity in China and India are likely to be from renewable energy. This will have significant implications for copper demand, which is used for wind turbines, solar panels, and distribution networks. Even with the strong growth in renewables, the energy supply mix in these two Asian giants will continue to be dominated by oil, gas, and coal. As we look to 2030, we forecast that over 79% of the world's energy could still be supplied by oil, gas, and coal under our central scenario. However, we are unlikely to see gas replace coal globally at the scale and pace seen here in the US. The fastest growing Asian economies have easier access to large coal reserves than they have to cheap gas. Driven by strong political support and policies, renewables are likely to be a rapid growing source of energy as Asian governments look to secure energy supply and balance development while limiting carbon emissions. The Asian growth story is set to continue for many years, which will underpin strong energy and commodity demand. And the world has the resources it needs to meet this future demand, despite what some people may say. The future security of energy and mineral commodities is a matter of governance, not geology. What is above the ground usually matters more than what is below, is a favourite saying in our organisation. Things like access to resources, development decisions, supply chain factors, transparency in trade, and the way markets operate will all influence the source of future supply. Countries will have to compete for investment if their resources are to be developed. Countries that conduct business openly and transparently have the potential to attract greater, more responsible and longer term business investment. The fiscal and political environment that governments create can either facilitate or impede investment in new production. Stability, consistency and certainty as well as transparency are vital agreements, ingredients to bring capital and investment opportunities together. Equally strong, equally strong partnerships created and fostered by governments can further support economic growth and jobs in both developed and developing countries. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is a striking example which will set a path towards free trade in the Asia Pacific. We have been the forefront, we have been at the forefront of pursuing transparent markets for our products so that the final pricing reflects supply and demand fundamentals. So in conclusion, we are positive about the future Demand for energy and commodities will continue to be strong over the long term. And this is underpinned by population growth with the, additional, with the addition of 2 billion people in the next 35 years. Again, a staggering number. 2 billion people who aren't here, who will be here in 35 years if you take the UN forecast right, who will aspire to everything you and I aspire to on a daily basis. The Chinese economy is now building upon a much larger base and the transition to consumption-led economic growth will continue to shape global markets. Economic growth is reliant on energy. And all energy sources, from fossil fuels and nuclear to renewable energy, will be important. To supply the resources the world needs, free trade, good governance, and transparent and open markets. And commodity prices must be based on real supply and demand fundamentals to ensure adequate supply of the commodities needed. So there is a bright future ahead, and we are prepared for it, and we are looking forward to the next phase of the commodity demand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean.
Could I ask the uh, panelists to come up? Uh, thank you, Dean, for that comprehensive view of uh, the global commodities trends and uh, especially the uh, position that BHP is is in in terms of adapting to the that what I'd call the center of gravity shift of energy and commodities in general to to Asia. So we're going to hear. Uh, some comments now from uh, our three panelists, and then we'll uh, we'll go into the Q and A session. So, uh, I'd like to ask Catherine to lead us off from CIBC. Catherine, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Guy, and, and thanks very much, Dean, for uh, setting us up with some uh, good good things to talk about here. Um, I'm going to give a, a bit of an energy centric view here, and just a, a few key themes that I think are are relevant to this discussion. Um, one to start with, just given the price action we've seen in oil in particular over the last six months or so, I think it's worth sort of revisiting the question of short term versus long term. Uh, when is something a paradigm shift in the markets and when is it part of a, a, a normal cycle? And, and I think we're all still sort of uh, working through that question with respect to this oil market. But, but one thing I, I would throw out there is that um, I've been starting a lot of my presentations to clients lately by uh, reminding people why it was that oil prices were so high for so long, not too long ago. Because I think in a market like this, memories to, do tend to get very short very quickly. And, and there were some good reasons that oil prices were high. Uh, we, uh, outside of the U.S., in the non-OPEC countries, on a net basis, really have not seen any growth. We've actually seen contraction in oil production in non-OPEC outside of the U.S., over the last five years or so. And that was, of course, in a $100 oil price environment. So now we are in an oversupplied market, and it, it can be a little bit hard to see through that. Uh, but we're increasingly in a market that will be supplied by growth from the US and Saudi Arabia, a bit of a, a bipolar uh, supply scenario. And in the long run, uh, even with a, a sort of a mediocre rate of global oil demand growth, that's probably not enough. So really, the US is not the marginal oil barrel here. We're going to need a different marginal oil barrel eventually, and, and that will take a, a price higher than 60, anyway, I think, to, to get that done. Um, the other theme that has, has gotten a lot of play, or the other narrative that's gotten a lot of play since prices have fallen, is this whole shale versus shake uh, sort of narrative that, that was, of course, on the cover of The Economist, and uh, is very catchy and uh, very novel, but I think it's probably a little bit overdone. Uh, the, the, the biggest sort of binary variable here in this oil market over the last six months has, of course, been the change in Saudi strategy, which has been uh, a game changer, really. Um, but, but I think it's a, a vast oversimplification to chalk that all up to a, a battle with, with newbie U.S. producers. I think that there are a lot of other variables driving this strategy, and, and one that probably doesn't get enough play is concerns about the long-term oil demand growth trajectory. Uh, we have really never seen a period of time where oil prices were this high for this long. And for that reason, we don't have a great data precedent for what that does to demand elasticity, to supply elasticity, uh, even to the way that the, ec the economy interacts with oil prices. A lot of our modeling uh, on that topic is, is from the 70s and 80s still. So we don't really have uh, a precedent for this. And I think that one of the chief concerns of Saudi Arabia and probably other producers over the last decade has been what a sustained period of high oil prices would do to structural oil demand. So in a way, what we're seeing now is a, a bit of a grand experiment. We're, we're going to find out how uh, or whether or not that, that demand rebounds or how much of the change has been structural and long term. I think uh, I'm fairly comfortable saying that OECD oil demand growth has probably peaked uh, and, and will be flat to declining on average going forward. And I think probably the most important example of that is U.S. gasoline. Uh, there, there's been a variety of reasons why we've seen a structural decline in U.S. gasoline demand uh, or demand growth. Uh, one is our, our shift of part of that pool into biofuels. One has been policy driven with increased fuel economy standards. But part of it has been driven by consumer behavior in response to price. And, and that, that's not necessarily coming back. Once you build uh, even a more efficient SUV, uh, you might buy more SUVs, but you're not going to buy uh, SUVs with 10-year-old efficiencies anymore. But what's probably even more important to look at, we all know the big delta, is in the non oest countries. And um, uh, as much talk and, and concern as we hear about 
what's going on in China right now, this year's oil demand in China has actually looked pretty good. And uh, I think it's important to remember that even a bad energy demand growth year in China still makes China the biggest contributor to global oil demand growth in, in the world, even in a bad year. And uh, I, I think we would be remiss to think that the type of growth that we saw uh, in the middle of last decade, around 2004, was going to continue forever. And at that time, one of my pet peeves was the charts that sometimes people would put up in 2004 saying, if Chinese oil demand continued to grow just like this for the next 30 years, <laughs> China would, you know, if we straight line that out, China would use more oil than anybody could possibly produce, which is probably true. But uh, of course, um, those, those kinds of trends are, are never straight lines. And, and typically what we see in a country's development uh, trajectory with respect to energy intensity is that we see a big spike in energy intensity as GDP first starts to grow and a country moves into a manufacturing stage. And then we see sort of a logarithmic decline in that energy intensity as either the manufacturing becomes more efficient and then, of course, they move into more of a services-based uh, phase of, of GDP growth. In China, I don't think we should necessarily be surprised if that decline curve is even steeper than what we've seen in some other parts of the world. Really out of necessity, China can't develop the way that uh, other countries have, have developed before it for environmental reasons, demographic reasons, and, and probably other reasons as well. That said, even if energy intensity declines steeply in China, we are still looking at a significant amount of growth uh, year over year and, and, and over time, and, and that's really important. Um, the, the one other point I, I would make on, on oil is that uh, we, we all sort of got lulled into a bit of a false sense of complacency uh, over the last few years because we had such a range-bound market in oil, and, and now we're back to volatility, which is really what we all used to be accustomed to in, in oil. But uh, I think that this creates um, some winners and losers. And uh, if, if I could throw out one sort of idea for, for feedback, is that uh, perhaps on some level, command economies deal better with volatility than uh, free market countries do in, in a lot of ways. And, and that is why I don't think we can necessarily expect uh, Chinese demand to behave exactly the way other countries do with respect to economic growth or, or even response to price. Uh, this is a, a command economy with a lot of artificial levers that, that can change that equation. Uh, I've been very oil focused, just a very brief comment on natural gas. Whereas on the oil side, uh, globally, we have a, a few concerns, I think, about both long-term demand and long-term supply on the oil side. Gas is a little different. I think it's a very, very positive outlook for both long-term gas supply and long-term gas demand. The trick is when uh, one of those timelines gets a bit ahead of the other for a little while. And of course, that does tend to happen with gas because of the very uh, high capital intensity of uh, the distribution of gas internationally. So you can get legs and leads. And I, I think we are in for a period here of several years where perhaps the supply does get a bit ahead of the demand. That said, uh, given the backdrop of climate and other air quality uh, concerns, particularly in, in um, developing Asia now, I think, uh, it's hard for me to see a scenario where long-term gas demand does not have a, a very positive outlook. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Now, now we're going to turn to Alan from the World Bank. Thank you, Guy. And uh, Dean, that was a fascinating uh, uh, talk. Uh, greatly appreciated your insights on uh, various things. Uh, I'll pick up uh, on uh, some of the themes that, uh, that uh, Catherine mentioned. I, I also apologize for being very energy focused. Um, perhaps we'll leave it to Scott to, uh, to break that chain. Um, what, I, what I wanted to pick up on mostly was uh, a comment that uh, Dean concluded on, which was uh, you know, a world where uh, commodity prices respond to, to market signals, to supply and demand, and the, the fundamentals there. Um, I, I think that uh, we're, we're living in a world where the visibility that we may have had on these issues in the past isn't there. When we look forward, it's cloudy, it's not clear. And it's cloudy for a number of reasons. Um, let's address some of those reasons. 2010. About 1% of the world's electricity demand came from uh, what we call modern renewable energy. And last year it was about 5%. At 5% of global electricity demand, the, the amount of 
modern renewable energy, and this is mostly solar and wind, and it's in markets like China and Western Europe and the United States, it's equivalent to about seven and a half trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It's equivalent to about 500 million tons of coal. Uh, on the natural gas front, that quantity is about 20% of global trade in, in natural gas, both pipeline and LNG. For thermal coal, the coal that goes into power generation, it's 50%, 500 million tons. So if that variable renewable energy is coming into markets, it's coming into markets when the wind blows, when the sun shines. It's not coming in necessarily when electricity is at its most valuable. And it's highly subsidized. From year to year, responding to subsidies, people invest in that or not, and it's very, very volatile. A market can add tens of thousands of gigawatts in one year, and then go down to a few thousand the next year, and then back up. Um, and why, it, why is that happening? It's happening because of concerns, obviously, about the energy mix and the impact on carbon emissions and the like. Um, the, over that period from 2010, uh, let's take the commodities. Thermal coal exported from Newcastle in Australia, a key marker in Asia. Central Appalachian coal, a key marker for uh, coal in the United States. Uh, natural gas prices everywhere. Uranium oxide. Uh, and uh, oil. Now the oil price decline started later, but every commodity that I mentioned in that time period, the price has fallen by half. And you might be thinking to yourself, I'm gonna go out and invest in renewables. The S&P Clean Energy Index over that same period has also fallen by 50%. So we have an energy market that in this context of climate concerns and in the context of the economic growth we have, kind of looks like it might be cannibalizing itself, right? The, the, the renewables curse might be real. And as I'm a uh, signed up member of the World Bank, I'm usually not allowed to, to even acknowledge that the renewable curse might be a real, right? That's a, 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 a story that, uh, that, that people uh, tell, uh, tell us to scare us. But uh, there's some evidence there that, that in these markets, uh, the, the prices of commodities are being undermined by these policies. And when those prices go down, it changes the competitiveness versus the renewables that we're trying to increase uh, the market for, basically. So, so that, I think, is a, um, a kind of interesting phenomenon. And it impacts, if you make the decision today to invest in particularly natural gas uh, or uh, power generation of any kind of conventional sort, you are, especially in markets that, that are competitive, and that's a lot of the world's market, and an increasing number of developing country markets, you are, you are looking at uh, uh, prices that are going to be undermined by zero variable cost renewables, and you have to take that into account uh, when you make those investments. The problem there is that these are very, the, the investment cycle for a new coal plant, the investment cycle for an LNG project, the investment cycle for deep water oil, the investment cycle for a lot of things has, if anything, increased. But the investment cycle for shale gas, for renewables, uh, wind and solar particularly, is a matter of months. So an LNG project, if I want to do that, five years. If I want to uh, uh, produce more gas in the Haynesville, a matter of weeks, a matter of weeks. So this is leading uh, to problems with visibility. And a lot of downside risks for people holding certain kinds of assets, which is one of the reasons why people increasingly talk about asset monetization. If you are holding carbon intensive resources, should you produce now? Because they might be worth nothing in the future. That would be an academic issue if not for the fact that the Saudis actively talk about asset monetization. Whether they're serious or whether they're just trying to scare American shale producers, who knows, but they talk about it. Um, the final thing that I want to comment on very briefly is, uh, is subsidies. Uh, for me personally, I'd like to see a world in which there were no subsidies, not on the consumption of oil, gas, and coal, which you have in many emerging countries still, and you have some of that even in developed countries. Um, 
and a world with no subsidies on renewables. Because I think the removal of subsidies across the energy space will improve visibility. It will respond to what Dean was saying about it, it, market fundamentals based on technology supply demand, not on potentially distortive government uh, tax and subsidy policy. Um, I think what replaces that, if it's rational, would be a carbon tax. Right? That this is the thing that would, that, that if we could somehow commit to one, this is the thing that again improves visibility because it provides signals about the social cost of uh, carbon intensive fuels and allows them to be traded off against each other. Um, let me uh, conclude by saying that I see no possibility for any near term removal of distorting subsidies, whether on renewables or fossil fuels, and I see no term prospect for a meaningful uh, global carbon tax. Um, which means that I, uh, my prediction is that uh, even, in the, even in the medium term, the energy markets are fundamentally unpredictable. No one knows what's going to happen. Thanks. Well, for those of us who've been doing it for about 50 years, that's a very humbling remark. So thank you, Alan. And next we'll have Scott Miller, who we rely on here at CSIS when it comes to global trade issues, or international trade, and particularly multilateral agreements that are such as TPP. So, uh, Scott, over to you. Thank you, Guy, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I want to start out with real, really extending compliments to Dean for his optimism. <clears throat> what you heard is a story that, that captures the mood I personally feel when I go to Asia. Asia is an optimistic place. It's a place where you see potential and growth. And I think that's an important part of the story as we think about forecasting. Forecasting is notoriously difficult to do, uh, but uh, I think there is a real rational basis for optimism. The notion of, three bill th of two billion more people in the next 35 years, I used to be a guy who sold disposable diapers, so that's a really happy thought. <laughs> but the composition of that population growth, particularly in East Asia and the Pacific, is very exciting. There is a, there is a global middle class emerging and uh, Goldman Sachs estimates that, that the middle class worldwide is growing by 70 to 90 million people a year and will continue basically that growth rate through 2030. So it's not just more people, it's more people who are prosperous, more prosperous than their, than their, their fathers and mothers, uh, who, who are looking for a better life, who are more engaged and create this global middle class which has great implications for political stability and, and economic growth. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a story that is both optimistic, but it's also rational. I want to make the point that <clears throat> look at the counterfactual is look at forecasts of 40 years ago, 1975. The world was in the midst of a major disruption uh, uh, in hydrocarbon pricing because of the, of the actions of OPEC uh, starting in 1973. But, but 40 years ago, uh, the uh, Professor uh, Ehrlich's uh, Paul Ehrlich's famous book, The Population Bomb, which was published in 1968. And by the way, I checked Amazon today. It's still in print, okay? But it was a bestseller in 1975. I will tell you, Paul Ehrlich was wrong about almost everything, all right? And you can go back, if you want to chuckle, read the, read the book, okay? Uh, indeed, uh, Newsweek Magazine and Time Magazine in, in 1975. Uh, those of you uh, CSIS interns at the back, uh, see me later to, as to what a magazine is. <laughs> you may not have picked one up or seen it in, in, in reality. But both have published couple cover stories on the coming ice age and the phenomenon of global cooling. All right. The point is, in, in the long run, optimism pays off. The pessimists over the past 40 years have been wrong about everything from hydrocarbon supply to crop yields to geopolitics. And so optimism pays off. It also pays to be humble because uh, any forecast, even a 15-year forecast as, as, such as the one Dean laid out here, uh, has, to, has to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge ourselves what we don't know. I would point out, as I occasionally point out to my children, 10 years ago, the iPhone did not exist. Okay, if you've gone this far in the meeting without checking your iPhone, you're unusual, <laughs> okay? And we organize our life around this technology, but it was first sold in uh, June of 2007. 
So things happen even in a relatively medium term that are hard to predict. But I do think the optimism is warranted. Now, I want to, uh, I want to talk really about where, where Dean concluded his remarks, which at the conclusion he talked about the fiscal and political environments that governments create and the stability, consistency, and transparency that are, that are the prerequisite for investment. Because I think that's the real message uh, to all of us here in the United States, in the OECD, and in the world. That the, in order to uh, achieve what's really possible from these relatively optimistic futures, um, I think the major, particularly major developed economies, the United States and Europe especially, uh, are frankly doing too little right now to promote growth, to promote investment, and to promote innovation. Uh, if you look at the w World Bank's most recent, that would be June 2015, global economic outlook, their forecast for uh, the OECD as a whole in 2016 is 2.1% GDP growth. That includes Mexico and Korea, uh, uh, but Europe, Europe era, the Euro area was expected to grow 1.5% and only 1.8% in 2016 after actual contractions in 2012 and 2013. The U.S. economy is projected to grow at under 3%. Uh, 2.7% this year, 2.8% next. Uh, that ought to be disappointing to us, and candidly, I'm astonished that voters and politicians or elected officials in the United States and elsewhere are willing to accept this as the new reality. Uh, we, there's no need for that. We shouldn't be. To my, in my view here at home, uh, we are telling ourselves too many stories about things like secular stagnation and making excuses for slow growth. Uh, but currently, if you look at the U.S. economy, are we recovering and growing? Yes. Is it slow? Absolutely. Look, compared to any other recession uh, and, and the recovery from the recession. But we, we sit at labor utilization rates, labor force participation rates, which are very near 40-year lows. Uh, if you look at corporate balance sheets, there's are immense amounts of cash essentially on the sidelines that are not finding productive investment opportunities. And you know, corporations are, are quite rational entities. They respond to incentives. We've got the incentives wrong if we intend to grow. So, uh, so I, I think there is real opportunity, and that 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 the uh, the United States and Europe can stand up and contribute to the optimism that you sense when you're in Asia. Uh, finally, as the guy said, I'm the trade guy, and I'll close with a thought about trade policy because it is one of the components of economic growth. And a very important contributor to the rising tide of the global economy over the past 30 years. Uh, you know, if you look at since the mid 1980s, there have been a period uh, of time we call globalization. Uh, this was driven by technological change, advances in container shipping, advances in communications technology, as well as policy changes the opening of China, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the fall of communism. Uh, the Euro round of the GATT, lots of policy initiatives to free trade and to, to move in a direction of liberalization of trade uh, restrictions and of, of, of economic, deepening economic engagement. During that period, that 30 year period, um, merchandise trade as a share of global output grew from 23% in 1985 to 45% in 2007. So here you have this generation in which trade uh, change in trade grew about twice as fast as change in GDP, okay? It was remarkably beneficial. It created real welfare gains for the world. People were better off because of this. Now here's the recent history, and it's not very sunny. Uh, there was an expected collapse in 2008 with the financial crisis. But believe it or not, the world economy, uh, if you look at share of uh, merchandise trade as a share of the global economy, we've not yet reached the high we achieved in 2007. We're still below that in terms of propensity to trade. That's six years after the crisis. Uh, so look, a lot of reasons for this. In fact, it, there's not real clarity whether this is a secular uh, change or a, or a cyclical one, uh, but I do think it implies a policy problem uh, that it seems no one cares much about. So I'll take my, take my, uh, my, my microphone time here and, and raise the issue because I think we should care about it. We have a stalemate in Geneva uh, we had lapsed negotiating authority in the United States, lapsing interestingly enough in 2007. Um, you know, there's, there basically ha have been s stasis to, to actual reversions and closing of markets in a lot of the world. 
Uh, and, and now, I'm still very optimistic about the future, but I think re we really have work to do. And that work, frankly, starts with those of us here in the advice business and those of us in the United States. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Scott and uh, Alan and Catherine for your remarks. And uh, let me uh, start the questions off with uh, a couple to, to Dean that emerged from his remarks. You mentioned uh, the challenges we uh, all face with the climate change issues, and we have the huge COP meeting, Council of the uh, Conference of the Parties meeting in Paris in December. Uh, we're certain that some of the countries where BHP Billiton has strong markets like China and India will be making policy changes and in, in I know your company's positioning yourself as you mentioned to do things internally and externally uh, like you mentioned uh, carbon capture and, and storage. Would you like to elaborate a bit more on some of the things uh, BHP is doing in the climate change space? Yeah, I would. Thanks, Guy. But I'd really like to just maybe go back to what Alan said before. <clears throat> I think where the world can get it wrong is when you actually put policy in place as opposed to good governance. And I'd say that the renewables uh, situation is, is one where you actually force a sector to actually to increase its share as opposed to letting the market forces drive it. And so you know, one of our one of the underlying uh, planks of our of our climate change policy is to say we should price carbon. I prefer that to saying a carbon tax because a carbon tax always raises hackles. But if you say if you effectively price carbon, then that will drive the right behaviours, it will drive the right technology, it will actually push investment in the right area, which will give you the lowest cost abatement. It will ensure that you can continue to actually supply energy and it does not interfere with the competitiveness of your, your economy. Because if you offend any of those three, then whatever you do is doomed for failure. You can either skew your, you can skew your uh, mix by, by forcing it, or you can let the market supply that. And I think that's, that's one of the fundamental things. And if we, if we see anything that comes out of Paris, we'd like to think that there, it's probably, it's probably a wish too far to say we're going to have a price on carbon, we're going to pick a two degree path, and we're all going to happily wander off. But if you get a framework where we actually start to get that, and we can build on that, I think that would be great success. But coming back to what BHP is doing, and when we look and we do very, very detailed analysis of where the world's demand for energy is going to be, we do this quite agnostically because we supply all sectors, so we don't, we don't necessarily count any one horse in the race winning as long as a horse wins and we're normally on that horse, we're happy to, to go that way. And so when we look at what's, what's required, we, we can't see a world where you're not going to use fossil fuels. You, you can't, you've got a world where potentially 2 billion people are coming, at least 1.7 billion hooking up to electricity for the first time, and it would be a dangerous thing to deny them that. I think I'd be far more fearful of that than the effects, short-term effects of climate change. So we have to accept that's going to happen. Then you, then you say, but if you continue to pump carbon into the atmosphere, what is going to happen? And so that leads us then to the, the point of we're going to have to find ways of going to a lower carbon environment and uh, economy. And there's a whole range. Again, we, we see renewables, we see nuclear, we see fossil fuels all driving part of that. And so we would like to position ourselves as part of the solution. As we could sit back and say, well, we're just the suppliers of someone else's problem. So hence our strategy that uh, one of the things we want to do is invest in low emission technology. And that can range from high, high efficient, low emission power generation to carbon capture and storage, but even the whole continuum to basically batteries and, and storage and the like. And we see that by, by being involved in that, obviously private, private, uh, the private sector has a role to play that uh, will show some leadership, it will maybe inspire others, it will actually see things that may not have happened, but ultimately it only work if there is a, is a greater global governance on top which, price, which prices carbon and leads us to the right way. And, and the last point I'd make is I think the one thing that uh, I despair at at times is that mankind often consigns themselves to future incompetence. And yet you have a look at what we've developed and we always manage to do something different and better. And, and I think the iPhone example is a great one. I can remember being in the car in 1989 in Finland and the Finns were the ones who actually invented iPhones and uh, my cousin making a call from his car and I thought it was the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. 
and that wasn't that long ago. And, uh, and yet we, in the future, we consign ourselves to almost at stupidity at times. We, can't, we can invent something, but we can't solve the problem. So I'm an engineer, I'm a professional problem solver, and I'm an eternal optimist. Well, let me uh, pick up on that optimism because it would certainly was uh, a thread through your remarks. Scott chimed in saying he's very optimistic and maybe, you know, some of these above the ground issues got resolved, but we also realized that, you know, there's challenges, especially in these emerging economies, and Catherine mentioned uh, with China, we can't always count on that exponential straight line growth, and we're now seeing structural changes in both the Chinese and, and Indian uh, economies, which uh, could change the way you, a company like yours, deals with those markets. Uh, I'm sure as a strategist and a, and a, a chief commercial officer of EP, PHP, you, uh, you certainly worry or trying to meet these challenges of how do you deal with the China as you see it five, 10, 20 years from now and sim similarly with India. You mentioned some, some of the very optimistic data, but I know within inside that data there are there are uh, challenges for your company. Well, the way we do it is there's two lenses we apply. The, the first lens is you look at what, what the economy is going to demand to meet its next pace. And so, and I think we're seeing, as I said, we've seen China move into a consumption-led economy. Um, our central view is that that is going to occur. It will occur efficiently. There will be bumps and there'll be uh, lumps and bumps along the way, as I like to say. But certainly it seems to be heading the right way. In fact, if you look at the the source of Chinese GDP now, it's, uh, it's basically the services sector ex exceeds the industrial sector. So that's a, a clear sign. We, we track many signposts for each of our economies. And so then that allows us to basically say what are the base commodities needed to supply to actually for this country to achieve its goals. The second lens is then what you have a look at, what is that country endowed with? And then what is your offering on top of that? So you have a look at India, for instance. We see India as it goes into its basically for people go to its urbanisation phase and into its industrialisation phase, uh, they are certainly well endowed with iron ore, but metallurgical coal is something they're not. So we, we fact that into our thinking. We have a look at the sources of energy of each of the economies and then we fact that into our thinking. And that's what the idea of having our portfolio is for a central case is that we can basically tailor um, our offering to match each of the phases the economies are in. Thank you very much, Dean. Now uh, I'd like to open the floor. We've got uh, a fair amount of time, I think, for our Q's and A's. We, we do want to end uh, at 1 p.m. as we've promised uh, Dean and the panelists. So um, let me um, just say, would you please identify yourself and your affiliation and, uh, and try to, uh, although we don't discourage comments, if you want to make a comment, keep it short. Mainly questions. I think you were the, the first in the in front row here. Um, I'm Caitlin Antrim. I work with the Rule of Law Committee for the Ocean. So I spent a lot of time looking at China's development of transportation network that reaches to Africa, to the Gulf, even up north to Russia, where they're building nine ice-breaking LNG tankers. So we're seeing now with the Asian Infrastructure Bank a chance to, for them to focus even more on this. How do you see a growing transportation network and network in, in natural resources around that region centered on China affecting the commodities market, say, in 20 years? And was that integrated into your thought about 2030, or is that something that'll come later? Obviously, the further out you go, the further out you go, the, the more difficult it is. And I think uh, Alan summed it up nicely in that uh, in, when you're doing commodity forecasting, you always hope to be directionally perfect, but uh, your price point always completely wrong. <laughs> but uh, directionally perfect is what we aim to do. But I would see opening up transportation uh, and, and the like, it's almost like free trade. I mean, what it does is it allows an, an economy to shift, to shift uh, their purchasing power to the lowest cost. And so when you see reservationist, when you see restrictions, when you see bans, what it's effectively doing, it's, it's putting an impost on an economy. And so you're not allowing the cheapest source of energy to actually arrive at the, at the point 
prepared to pay that price. So I just see it as a, as a, great, as, as a great factor. The other thing it will do also is that it will make uh, fossil fuels sticky. As the more infrastructure we spend on fossil fuels, and there is significant money uh, spent on fossil fuels now, and if you just do some calculations and convert over to, to something else, there's a massive amount of sunk cost as write-offs to take. But the more, the more we actually build and the stickier it'll be, well, then it'll cause the dilemma of how does it compete, and, and I think it'll lead into having to decarbonise and basically, I think, carbon capture and storage of, of fossil fuels will float to the top again. Hi, Dave Ramaswamy with Africa Agribusiness Magazine. You know, oil, gas, oil, coal, and cement account for 75% of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So unlike feel-good methods like changing light bulbs or driving an electric car, to really move the dial on climate change, we gotta focus a revolutionary approach to changing or reducing greenhouse gas emissions in these sectors. And also, oil and coal have huge environmental and security externalities. And so going forward, where do you see a company like BHP Billiton aligning with the agriculture sector, you know, billion and a half people in the world are farmers, to produce non-food-based feedstocks for fuels and also distributed energy? So where do you see that partnership? Because historically, the extractive sector and agriculture sector have been at war and combative relationships. So where do you see an alliance going forward? Thank you. Well, it's, not that, it's not just that sector. I think the, uh, I think the fossil fuel sector has also been combative as well, it's, uh, which is not helpful. Um, look, our, our company strategy is pretty clear. It's on the, it's on the website. You know, we want to own and operate large, long-life resources. We want to stay upstream. We want to sell it at basically at a point of commodity into large markets. So I don't see our company strategy changing. Um, what, we, what we see is that uh, we will have an offering of, of commodities which will support the markets as they develop. And so while we're not in the renewables business and we do not uh, not likely to be in the renewables business, we see that copper is going to be a great facilitator of it. Um, and you have a look at some of the statistics I've seen there. The average, it took one hectare to feed three and a half people, I think, back in 1980. Um, if we're going to meet the global population, that's going to have to jump to five. And so we have to see yields in crops go up significantly. Um, and hence, we see potash as, as one of the one of the key, three key elements you can't, you can't actually, can't substitute. You can do without it for a while, but you can't substitute it. You'll, sooner or later you need it, so we're actually gonna have that in. But as far as actually uh, taking equity and going into some of these businesses, that would be contra strategy. Um, the investments we're gonna make in, in low emission technology, we see as, uh, as a way of actually abating our own, our own emissions, which we, we've targeted to do. It's, we've we're uh, basically taking a leading position here by saying that uh, even though we're growing our business, we're going to hold the emissions from our businesses at 2006 levels and we're working, working hard on that and achieving those numbers. But so we, we'd say it's more of a supportive and investive and basically synergistic role. Uh, hello, I'm Randall Doyle from Georgetown University. I want to say Mr. Valley, I've lived in Australia three years. I went there as a young man when I was 18 and it was at Harold E. Holt, a naval base in Western Australia. My son now teaches high school English there in Melbourne. Um, I want to touch on an issue that hasn't really been touched on, and it's directed to you, sir, and perhaps maybe the other three will comment on it, and that's political risk. Um, I hear the numbers, I hear the figures, all of this, but um, I'm sure you have a political risk department in essence of, you know, potentiality, for instance, like U.S.-China uh, interaction in the South China Sea and, and all that, and I'm sure you can't, make your evaluation separate from that because that's certainly a, a certain part of the reality. And so I'm wondering that when you are, in essence, trying to make some, some uh, estimations of what's going to happen in the future, trend lines, things of this sort, how much does uh, political risk figure into that? Because being a company of your magnitude in global reach and so forth, I'm assuming that you have to take that into consideration of uh, future investment and extraction of resources. Look, maybe I'll just give a quick answer and I'll explain without giving away too much. So we, we run a central case. So we run the world as, uh, as we would see. We basically we build up um, very deep analysis on commodities case by case, and, and we, we run a central case. Then on, on top of that, we, we do very, very 
even deeper analysis on, on steel because it affects two of our major commodities and we actually do a very deep analysis on the energy sector. And, and when I say energy sector, we look at everything from electric vehicle penetration through to uh, where gas, oil, um, what the substitution are. We, we look at um, you know, disruptive technology, what could they do, where could they be? We also, we also price carbon into everything we do. So we run a central case on carbon and we do that by having a, a very detailed build up of what it costs to abate a tonne of carbon. And then we, we figure out where the world is going to central case. And you can say it's a three degree world or a four degree world and how many tonnes of carbon need to be abated and what the cost of that is beyond the central point. And that's factored in. So once we've run our central case, then we run four scenarios around that. And those scenarios can be a world where it's ambivalent about carbon, where basically it's the world goes into a crisis state where everyone's worried about their energy security, uh, stability and basically growth and abandons the, the, the worry about that and it consigns that to future generation. And then we go to, to a very green world where we're all driven to hit two degrees faster than what we would have. And we, and we actually, in each of those cases then, we will then we'll flex what the likely scenarios and demands are. We'll put political implications in. So China and the US cooperation works, uh, India grows or India stalls. We factor all those things in and we basically rerun demand for each of those. And out of that, basically, we actually reforecast our price and then we work economic valuation. So when people say you've got a stranded asset, we'd say, well, we've tested that already because we've basically picked, we've picked the worst case. We've factored in what it could be if, if you did have a disruptive technology. This happened. You took a two degree world and, uh, and we factored in. We understand our valuations and act accordingly. So you're absolutely right. We, we do do it and we basically and we build on, on year on year. Any more than that would be giving away secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, panelists like to comment on that? Scott, how, how about your experience with political risk with Procter & Gamble? Or, or well, it's it's always a factor in, in businesses, and, and in, in many cases, companies like BHP Biloton, like P&G and others, are, tend to enter uh, enter foreign markets for the long term. They're looking for long, be a long-run participant in the economies where they enter. They ser they're often serving the local consumers. So the questions get answered over a long period of time. Uh, Near-term political risk is, is often manageable and you try your best to do that. Uh, but, but basically one of the things that, the, the, one of the core benefits of the sort of the, 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 the multilateral order, particularly the rules-based trading system, is it has a way, it's, a, it's essentially hedging. It's a way to, to, to constrain uh, the, 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 uh, the, the tails uh, of risk. It doesn't work all the time, doesn't work everywhere. Uh, and there are there there are always uh, things things fall apart. I uh, remember uh, our, our company made a decision to locate in uh, a Latin America headquarters, and the absolute right place to do that in 1987 was Caracas, Venezuela. <laughs> okay, and so sometimes things don't work out the way you plan. Uh, but you do you do both hedging and you you do you continue to have a risk horizon uh, that you're evaluating all the time. The 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 uh, the international economic order is very important to as a way to, to, to constrain the outliers and to manage that risk over time. Any other panelists? Uh, oh, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll make a quick comment here. Someone's microphone's on this. Oh, there it is. Um, well, I'll make a comment with feedback, too. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, when I joined the bank in the late uh, 90s, we didn't think too much about uh, uh, the development issues associated with uh, fragile and conflict-affected uh, states. Um, and now that's a, a very uh, substantial part of our operational activity. Um, we didn't think too much about uh, disaster risk management and responding to disasters. Again, that's something that is a, is a major part of our, um, uh, of our activities now. Um, w you know, the, the, the bank lends with no regard to the the political nature of, uh, of of the countries. We don't take positions in elections or anything like that. So we, we have a different profile on political risk. Um, but what I what we observe is uh, not so much uh, political risk, but but bureaucratic stagnation in so many countries that make the operating environment for whether uh, public lenders like ourselves or private companies like BHP very very difficult. Um, we. We, we see a lot of uh, places that operate according to the uh, uh, according to the philosophy of you never make a mistake if you never make a decision, right? And that's the reality in, in a lot of countries that good projects 
whether infrastructure or natural resources, are waiting to be invested in by people who, who have the expertise, the, the management, the technical ability uh, to, to go ahead with that, and the risk-taking initiative, right? And these projects sit there and never get developed. And we, we all may, may be re retired but before some of these good projects uh, might get developed. And I can think of multi-billion dollar projects uh, just in countries I work in in Asia where that's been the case. Um, and, and that is increasingly, the, I think, the biggest political risk that investors face is, is that, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you want to move forward and you can't get decisions made in the, in the market which, which you're interested in. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, John Keogh here from the Australian Financial Review. I had a question for Dean. Um, Dean, in the last few days we've seen the price of uh, BHP's biggest commodity and Australia's biggest exporter to iron ore really plunge uh, below $50 to a decade low. Uh, what's your assessment of what's driving the iron ore price going lower at the moment? Um, is it driven by supply and demand fundamentals as per some comments in your speech? And also, do you see any link between what's going on in the iron ore market and the Chinese stock market? Uh, look, I, I think short-term volatility in commodity prices is something you're always going to be completely wrong on, so I'm not even going to speculate. Um, and I really take the long-term view. Um, we, you know, we saw that uh, you saw this unprecedented demand for iron ore going back a decade ago. Um, prices went high. It's incentivised a lot of supply that now probably shouldn't be there. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult. And uh, so now you have a, a demand which is still strong, but it's a very well supplied market. And so you, I think you've basically seen the effects of that. I mean, and they will bounce around from day to day. They'll overshoot and undershoot. But uh, long term, it is going to come back to fundamentals. It's, it's a very transparent market. It's open market and it'll, it'll respond. Um, I don't know that you could actually correlate it. Be, if I was that clever to correlate it between what's going on in the stock market, you could probably uh, you'd make a lot of money, but I can't correlate that at all. <laughs> This is going to have to be the last two questions. We'll start with Mark Carr in the back, and then one. That's fine. Thank you. I've um, been reading some more and thinking more about uh, and the one element of political risk of uh, state corruption. And I know you know you folks have a global view and. Uh, bureaucratic stagnation and other things. Uh, how, do, how does state corruption, like massive corruption in some of these markets, uh, impact the, um, the direction of these things go? Yes, hi, and thanks, Guy. Uh, Jim Ostroff, um, an editor with Platts, and for Mr. De La Valle, um, in recent years, the price of uranium, as you know, has tanked down more than 50% from 2011. I'm interested in, and in recent years, we've had major producers, whether it be Rio Tinto recently in Australia, Paladin, even Cameco, announce they're not moving ahead or closing facilities because of the price situation. I'd be interested in your outlook going forward for uranium prices, and in particular, anything you would say about the outlook for Olympic Dam. Thank you. I was going to try and pass the question on to, uh, to Catherine, but I don't think I can pass that one on. <laughs> It'd be a bit unfair. <laughs> but I will. The second one should be Catherine's. Uh, yeah. I've always wasted a great opportunity here to have a view. Um, look, Olympic Dam is a great resource. Uh, it's, uh, it's, in a, it's a great part of the world. Uh, many billions of tons there, its time will come. It's really about us matching it to market. It's obviously c contains a lot of uranium, which we see as a very, very important co-product to copper out of Olympic Dam. Uh, I'm not, I won't talk about price, for future price forecast. Obviously for uranium, we see, we see the growth of nuclear power when we look at our energy mix as, as an important part of that. There's no doubt that uh, there's been a massive big road bump uh, as a result of Fukushima. And so, well, I think what you're seeing is the uh, basically demand 
and supply fundamentals playing out. Also, the other unique thing about the Iranian business is that, uh, as unlike, say, an energy coal, uh, an energy coal operation where you may have 60 days or 30 days supply ahead of you, uh, the average nuclear power station could have three years, maybe five years of supply. So there's no there's no immediate need to run to the market at any point in time. So to start correlating, and you know, in, it could be short term, it could be months in that business to what, what you see price is extremely difficult to do. The other, the other thing I'd draw your attention to is if you go and have a look at, I mean, uranium hasn't been around that long, right? And uh, you have a look at, uh, as, as a product, you have a look at the amount of uranium produced since about 1945, and you have a look at how much has been consumed. There's, and there's obviously there's an overhang there, and a lot of it is sitting in weapons, a lot of it has actually been converted. The, uh, the, uh, the megatons, the megawatts is still playing out, and I think that also is another factor inside the inside the supply side. So if you, if you put all that together, you have a look at the, I wouldn't say inertia, but the, the lack of urgency to go and buy it, uh, then it, it'll play itself out. And if, if supply is cutting off and, and demand continues to go, then it's going to induce new supply. And that's the market will once again behave. Yeah, the, Mark asked the question about corruption. And, and I was going to let someone else handle that one. Well, I work for a Canadian bank, so I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to, <laughs> to address corruption. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, in terms of oil supply, certainly that it's not it's not a, a new theme. I mean, oil is not always conveniently located, obviously, um, but I think that that is one uh, one of many variables that has made North America attractive over the last ten years. Um, it, it's not necessarily the cheapest barrel, but it's also not necessarily the most expensive barrel and, and has a lot of other above ground conditions that, that make it an attractive investment um, from government governance to, uh, to access to capital, uh, which, which has also been clearly very, very abundant over the last 10 years. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add. I don't know if any of the other panelists wanna, wanna address that. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, uh, the World Bank, uh, we probably don't need a, uh, a definition of the word corruption, uh, unfortunately. Um, we, uh, we really do wrestle with uh, governance and, and uh, transparency and outright corruption issues uh, in, uh, in all of our business, dating back to the beginning, pretty much. It's, uh, it's, it, it is a, uh, a growth killer. Um, project killer, and it's very difficult to deal with. Having said that, uh, we, uh, for those of you who don't know, the World Bank houses the Extractive uh, Industries Transparency Initiative, the EITI. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think that uh, uh, is, is noteworthy has been very strong support from uh, the world's extractive industries, uh, the, the producers, the private companies, being transparent about payments made to government wasn't an automatic and kind of instinctive thing for those companies, but uh, uh, we have a very broad support in the industry now, and increasingly among the, the countries uh, as well. There's still a few that, that are joining slowly with different concerns, but we're getting towards a more transparent space, at least in the extractives, and I think that's a good thing and I think this is a this is a this is something that's going to be hard to reverse. Having you know a country joining uh, extractive in industries transparency initiative, it's going to be noticed if they then withdraw. Um, we we have a long way to go, but even in in countries where you know you 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 think uh, corruption sometimes Nigeria comes to mind. Uh, Nigeria released uh, uh, the PwC Missing Millions report, in a, uh, which makes fascinating reading. Uh, for those of you who, who can wade through 199 pages, it's an amazing report. And it may not change things overnight, but the transparency on the NNPC Missing Millions is, is rather remarkable, and that just came out a few months ago, so there's that. You know, the broader corruption thing, I can tell you, it, it takes decades, all right? Um, we have a few good examples of countries that really deal decisively with it. I mean, Singapore comes to mind. But um, reaching that tipping point where all of a sudden one day 
it's part of the landscape, it's part of the business, you just, you, you kind of, you don't see a lot of it happening from my perspective, but you know it's happening to a point where it becomes unusual and, and, and really not a significant part. Getting to that tipping point it just takes a long, long time. And no matter what you read in the headlines, no matter which head of state you see my president embrace because the guy is a shining example of good governance, don't believe every headline you read. If I could just add, we were one of the, the founding signatories to that, uh, that process as well. I was going to ask that question. I'm glad it was a bit positive. <laughs> so we've reached our allotted time, and I want to thank you all once again for uh, your being here and for your uh, penetrating and uh, interesting questions. Please join me in uh, thanking Dean and Alan, Catherine, and Scott. Thank you very much.